Hello listeners and welcome back to Sandman Stories Presents. Today we are traveling back to the Yoruba homelands in present day Nigeria. We will be covering the legends of the Leopard Man, a mysterious hunter who transforms into a dangerous beast, the Water Bird and why it only stands on one leg, and the Ants who just want to help out the poor but kind man. Okay, let's begin. The Leopard Man A handsome stranger once came to a certain village and strolled among the people in mysterious silence. All the maidens admired him and wished that he would choose one of them for his bride. But he said nothing and at last walked away into the forest and disappeared from sight. A month later the stranger came again and this time one of the maidens fell so much in love with him that she resolved to follow him into the forest, as she could not bear to be separated from him. When the stranger looked back and saw her coming behind him, he stopped and begged her to return home. But she would not, and exclaimed, I will never leave you, and wherever you go, I will follow. Beautiful maiden, you will regret it, replied the stranger sadly as he hurried on. After a while he stopped again, and once more begged her to retrace her steps, but she made the same reply, and again the handsome stranger said in sorrowful tones, You will regret it, beautiful maiden. They went far into the depths of the forest, and at length reached a tree, at the foot of which there lay a leopard skin. Standing under the tree, the stranger began to sing a melancholy song in which he told her that though he was allowed once a month to wander about in villages and towns like a man, he was in reality a savage leopard and would rend her in pieces as soon as he regained his natural form. With these words he flung himself upon the ground and immediately became a snarling leopard and began to pursue the terrified girl. But fear gave such speed to her feet that he could not overtake her. As he pursued her, he sang that he would tear her into small pieces, and she in another song replied that he would never overtake her. For a great distance they ran, and then the maiden suddenly came to a deep but narrow river, which she could not cross. It seemed as if the leopard would catch her after all. But a tree which stood on the river bank took pity on her and fell across the river, so that she was able to cross. At last, nearly exhausted, she came to the edge of the forest and reached the village in safety. The leopard, disappointed by its prey, slunk back into the forest, and the handsome stranger was never seen again. The End Okay, and story number two, the water bird. The water bird always stands on one leg, and this is why. A water bird once, in search of food, swallowed the king of the crabs, and the whole tribe of crabs were so enraged that they swore they would have their revenge. We will find this horrible bird, they declared, and nip off its legs. We shall not fail to find it, for its legs are bright pink in color, and its feathers are pink and white. But the water rat overheard the crabs plotting, and hastened to tell the water bird. Oh, oh, cried the water bird. They will nip off my beautiful pink legs, and then what will become of me? Whatever can I do? It is very simple, replied the water rat. If you stand on one leg, they will think you are some other creature. The bird thanked him, and tucked up one leg. When the crabs came, they saw, as they thought, a very tall pink bird with one leg and a large beak. Our enemy has two legs, they said. This cannot be him. And they passed by. The end. 
Story number three, The Ants and the Treasure. There once was a poor man who was very kind to animals and birds. However little he had, he always spared a few grains of corn or a few beans for his parrot. And he was in the habit of spreading on the ground every morning some tidbits for the industrious ants, hoping that they would be satisfied with the corn and leave his few possessions untouched. And for this, the ants were grateful. In the same village there lived a miser, who had by crafty and dishonest means collected a large store of gold, which he kept securely tied up in the corner of a small hut. He sat outside this hut all day and all night, so that nobody could steal his treasure. When he saw any bird, he threw a stone at it, and he crushed any ant which he found walking on the ground, for he detested every living creature and loved nothing but his gold. As might be expected, the ants had no love for this miser, and when he had killed a great many of their number, they began to think of how they might punish him for his cruelty. What a pity it is, said the king of the ants, that our friend is a poor man while our enemy is so rich. This gave the ants an idea. They decided to transfer the miser's treasure to the poor man's house. To do this, they dug a great tunnel under the ground. One end of the tunnel was in the poor man's house, and the other was in the hut of the miser. On the night that the tunnel was completed, a great swarm of ants began carrying the miser's treasure into the poor man's house. And when morning came, and the poor man saw the gold lying in heaps on the floor, he was overjoyed, thinking that the gods had sent him a reward for his years of humble toil. He put all the gold in the corner of his hut and covered it up with native cloths. Meanwhile, the miser had discovered that his treasure was greatly decreased. He was alarmed and could not think how the gold could have disappeared, for he had kept watch all the time outside the hut. The next night, the ants again carried a great portion of the miser's gold down the tunnel, and again the poor man rejoiced, and the miser was furious to discover his loss. On the third night, the ants labored long and succeeded in removing all the rest of the treasure. The gods have indeed sent me much gold, cried the poor man, as he put away his treasure. But the miser called together his neighbors, and related that in three consecutive nights, his hard-won treasure had vanished away. He declared that nobody had entered the hut but himself, and therefore the gold must have been removed by witchcraft. However, when the hut was searched, a hole was found in the ground, and they saw that this hole was the opening of a tunnel. It seemed clear that the treasure had been carried down the tunnel, and everyone began hunting for the other end of the tunnel. At last, it was discovered in the poor man's hut. Under the native cloths in the corner, they found the missing treasure. The poor man protested in vain that he could not have possibly crept down such a small tunnel, and he declared that he had no notion how the gold got into his hut, but the rest said that he must have some magic charm by which he made himself very small and crept down the tunnel at night into the miser's hut. For this offense, they shut him up in a hut and tightly closed the entrance. On the next day, he was to be burnt alive. When the ants saw what had become of their plan to help him, they were sorely perplexed and wondered how they could save the poor friend from such a painful death. There seemed to be nothing for them to do but eat up the whole of the hut where the prisoner was confined. This they accomplished after some hours, and the poor man was astonished to find himself standing in an open space. He ran away into the forest and never came back. In the morning the people saw that the ants had been at work, for a few stumps of the hut remained. They said, The gods have taken the punishment out of our hands. The ants have devoured both the hut and the prisoner. And only the ants knew that this was not true. The End When I think of your goodness and the love that you show, Papa, I know it's strong. Oh, Gaga, when me was Okay, in the first story, I absolutely love the imagery of a man turning into a jaguar. 
There's a lot of animal shape-shifting in the old stories, and it really makes me smile. The second story is what I would call a just-so story or a why story. When people see animals doing something strange, they come up with such interesting stories to explain or even just to entertain, and that's always a pleasure to read. And in the third story, I like how the ants wanted to do something good, but ended up hurting the kind man. But then they kind of rescued him in the end. I'd like to think that he ran away with some of the treasure too. It would be only fitting for him to get something for losing his home. And the podcast shout out is to the By the Fire podcast. Anyone who has listened to my podcast for a few episodes know that I love stories from the continent of Africa. Well, here is someone doing it better than me. Ken is a first generation UK citizen with roots in Nigeria. She not only finds the folk tales and tells them, but she also interviews experts on different topics related to African folklore from across the diaspora. In this way, she reminds me of Amam Mazinga of the Afro Tales podcast. And if you like her podcast as much as I do, go and give her a rating and review on Podchaser, iTunes, Good Pods, or Spotify. And the listener shout-out is to Sierra Leone, situated next to the country of Liberia in the western sub-Saharan Africa. Sierra Leone shares a similar history for once being part of the Monday Empire, then being invaded by Europeans, and finally as slavery was outlawed, pressure was put on the British Africans to move there as people like Pitt the Elder didn't want to see them in London. This partially explains why both Liberia and Sierra Leone have a large English-speaking populations, along with local versions of English called Creo, spelled K-R-I-O, that is influenced by Jamaican Maroon Creole, Akan, Yoruba, Igbo, and Black English from America and Canada. And shock of all shocks, I would like to go visit there someday. I will be attempting to speak Creole. Pardons for pronunciation and such. Tenki adegona aus. Thank you, and I'm going to my home.